Welcome to Jackie's Literary Corner. I am Jackie, and it's time for Seven on Sunday, and this week's topic is Seven Annoying Characters. So, this is kind of a mixture of characters that I think were meant to be annoying and that were not, and characters that were not meant to be annoying, but they annoy me personally. Okay, let's start with a classic and a female character that was really annoying, and that is a character is the character Miss Elton from Emma, which is funny because I think you could say that Emma and Miss Elton are very similar in their way of thinking. Um, but I think, but of course, Emma is our tell character, so she grows and learns from her mistakes and stuff like that. Um, while Miss Elton, you know, she's a secondary character who have, doesn't grow, but will probably eventually, you know, if, this, the, if there was a story written about her character, she would grow as a person. And But, you know, in real life, there's no guarantee characters like her will grow. She is that hoity-toity character who thinks she knows everything and thinks she's so superior in knowledge. And, which is kind of, like I said, she's very similar to Emma. Um, and she does some of the same things Emma does. Like, Emma tried, the plot of this book is Emma sees herself as a matchmaker, even though, ironically, she doesn't want to get married. And she's a spoiled little brat and very vain and kind of selfish and tries to mold her new friend Harriet Smith into her little twinsy. And, you know, she tries to fix her up and play matchmaker. Well, Miss Elton does the exact same thing to the character of Jane Fairfax, who is very similar to Harriet, except for she's not as naive as Harriet. Miss Elton, like I said, is not introduced until later in the book. She is introduced as the character who marries the man who Emma rejects. The, she rejects Mr. Mr. Elton, who is totally into Emma and everything, he wants to marry her, but he misinterprets her. And so Emma turns him down and he leaves and he pitches a hissy fit about it. You know, he leaves with his tail between his legs. Um, and he eventually meets Miss Elton, you know, and they get married, and she becomes Miss Elton. Um, and, like, she is constantly giving advice to people. And you can tell, like, when she's trying to give it, help Jane out. Jane is like, I don't want it. But she doesn't say anything. She doesn't, she finds she's uncomfortable with this and doesn't want Miss Elton's advice. But... You know, she's not going to say anything to Miss Elton. She's not going to turn her down or be just like, I don't want your advice. You know, I mean, she could say it in a nice way, but Miss Elton will not, probably wouldn't listen. Um, but she is so snobby. She's like worse than Emma, but of course Emma's a character that, you know, changes in the, in the book. But she is just, mm, cannot stand her. Which I think she was supposed to be annoying. Next is a character that I have not, from the series, The Wheel of Time. And that is the character of Matt. Now, I've not read this book. I've only read the first book. Um, so I need to read this one. And I, you know, I think I'm going to read this one soon because I've been meaning to read it. Um, Matt is that guy, that little teenage punk, who you tell him not to do something and he'll do it anyway. Like, in the first book, there's something that he does that he's told specifically that he should not do because something bad might will probably happen. And, but he does it anyway. And it bites him in the ass. He's also someone who has this huge temper. He gets impatient and cranky. And throughout this, this journey, because this is one of those journey kind of stories, and you just, oh, I just want to punch him. I cannot stand that. And now, which is funny, because I think a lot of people love Matt, and I don't know why. I mean, yeah, there is a possible chance that he's going to grow on me later. But going my Murphy Napier's review has read all the books, you know. Now, granted, I don't always agree with Murphy Napier, but I have a feeling that, like her, I will not be able to stand that no matter what. He's just, he's annoying. Although, I do believe he gets a love interest and that makes things, he improves well. Because sometimes a character gets a love interest, as much as I hate to say it, that can improve the character. That can make them better. Which, and I say I hate to say it because, you know, I feel like a person shouldn't, you know, yes, people when they fall in love, a lot of times people are influenced by the people they fall in love with and they become better people. And, but, you know, it's like you should be able to like the character as an individual. Like, you, it's hard to, you know, you shouldn't, 
just like the character as a pair, you know? So, I um, mean, I don't downright hate him, but I can't, but I find him incredibly annoying. Okay, so next is a character that I don't have the series I got from the library, and he is part, only a part of the reason why I didn't have that series, and that is Fitzbacker from the um, Keeper of the Lost City series. I cannot see him. He is that golden boy that you just roll your eyes at because every girl loves him, and all the guys respect him, supposedly. And he's like, he's like a Gary Stu almost. Well, I mean, not exactly, because he is a complex, he's more complex than a Gary Stu, but still. Um, and then he's like, he is basically that night, he's the nice guy trope where he acts, he's a nice, charming guy, will do anything for you, for the person, he, the people he cares about. But then he has a temper and gets entitled. And if you don't want, and if you don't want anything to do with him, then he gets mad and offended. Like, because he's like, oh, I'm the better one, I'm the better person than that guy. And now, I know not everybody's agreeing with their problem, because I know, you know, from Goodreads, there are people that love Fitz, and that's great. If you love him, that's great, but I don't love him. And you can try to convince me all you want, but it's not going to work. I am never going to be convinced. And I, no, I, I didn't have a series, but I've read up to, you know, books one through seven, and I have not read books eight, or I started to read book eight, but then I got bored. For and all the other reasons of why I don't like it. But you know, I think I have a right to judge enough because I've read seven books in the series. You know, and I had a feeling it was going to be Endgame. So, I mean, there's a whole scene devoted to him and Sophie, you know, fixing a whole several chapters with them in the hospital and dealing with their wounds. It's like, she, you know, she and a messenger did not have to spend five chapters. Or, well, maybe not five. I don't remember how many, but there were quite a few chapters where it was devoted to them. And they were long chapters of flirting with each other. It's like, now, if you're a fan of them as a couple, then you probably love that. You probably ate, ate that's all that, that cuteness up. But because I did not love him and I'm Team Keith, I did not like them. And I think she could have, she could have skipped over. That wasn't important. That was not, showing that was not important. That was only for the people that were fans of them as a couple. You know? But and that that was not relevant. And I mean that's why a lot of times people get annoyed by YA books because they focus so much on the relationship drama. And especially if it's a fantasy or sci fi where there's a bigger problem. That's like I think that's why people do not like that in fantasy and sci fi because they focus so much on that your teen drama and it's like my boyfriend's immortal. And he could kill me, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh, people are telling me I shouldn't date him because he could potentially kill me. And I don't want him to date. Now, should, do I love him? Oh, he's a monster, but I love him. And, you know, all that. Now, in the case of the Keeper of the it was a different... It wasn't exactly like that, you know, because no one... <laughs> there was no, like, monsters. They were elves. Um, but, like... Although some people who do not like Sophie's character found her in a way, they think they deserve each other, her and Fitz deserve each other. You know? Unless, of course, they actually like Fitz's character. But I love Keith and I love Dex and I love Fitz's sister. And, you know, sometimes I did get annoyed by Sophie. But, you know, at times, and especially in YA and middle grade books, you know, a lot of times, which I don't even know if that series was YA or middle grade anymore. I assumed it was middle grade. It felt like middle grade, but then... They were older. They aged with the books. But anyway, Fitz just... Oh, he was so... He, and he has such temper. And he wants everyone to feel sorry for him. And it's everyone else's fault. And, you know, he's like a spoiled brat. And it takes a long time for him to grow as a character. I don't know, maybe he grew a lot in the eighth book. But he would have to grow a lot for me to like him. I can't stand him. He's just, oh, I just hated Fitz. Well, okay, hates a bit of a strong word, but I do not like him. Okay, next is one that I'm not quite finished with as of filming this video, but I'm filming this early, a week early. Um, and like, actually, it might be two weeks early. I'll have to look at the good in the Goodreads group on this. See if the seven on Sunday, when the seven on Sunday is supposed to be. But, um, either way, I'm filming this early. Um, so by the time you watch it, by the time it will be posted, I'll have this book returned. And, you know, 
I'll be done with it. But this conjuring you should groom her is never let me go. And the character is Ruth. So Ruth is that girl that tries so hard to be cool. And she can be caring and kind to her friends. But then if you embarrass her in any way or make her look bad, make her look uncool, then she'll turn around and embarrass you and make you look bad. Like, there's a scene. Okay, so these kids are the main characters in this. Tommy, Ruth, and Kathy, our title, our, our narrator, and all the, these group of kids there. I still don't know exactly. At this point, I don't know exactly what their story is, but I know that they are very sheltered. They don't live in the outside world. They live at a special, like, it's kind of like a, it's kind of a boarding school situation. And there's something very special about that. So they're very sheltered and not a lot of experience, including very little experience about sex. But they end up kind of discovering it on their own and when going by the little bits of information their guardians have taught them. And Kathy, our narrator, is for a long time, she's a virgin. And um, Ruth ends up dating Tommy for a period of time. I mean, and... Ruth, and they're of the age where they can leave their little school and go kind of into the outside world. Not exactly, but close enough into the outside world. And she sees this thing that these older kids that they're hanging out with are doing with each other, which I don't remember. It was something like slapping each other's arm or, you know, hitting each other playfully. That's their way of flirting with each other. They're a couple. And also, like, she might have seen it on TV or movies, like, copied it from a movie or TV show. And... Um, so one time her and earlier, like, there's one time where Kathy and Ruth are talking about this, and Kathy, who doesn't want to call her out on something else, that there was something else she was trying to tell, question her about, or talk to her about it, but she didn't want to, so she brings up this thing of them, her and Tommy, when they're doing their interactions with each other, and she says it's a little silly, and, you know, tells her, or she doesn't even say that, she's like, something along the lines of that. Well, you're kind of co just copying off of this from a TV show or whatever, or copying it because these other older, your older friends are doing it. And so, Ruth turns around after, and unfortunately Kathy kind of gave her the opening, and calls her out on something else. Like, her and Kathy had this intimate conversation about sex. And Kathy was a very sweet, naive girl who has a lot of experience. She's kind of interacting with a lot of guys. Not in a slutty way, but in a, you know, she's, you know, dating, like, and she's a really sweet, very naive person, you know, she just wants to understand it and experience it, and she tells this to Ruth in confidence, and at first, when, they're talk when they were talking about this, she was very sweet about it and understanding, kind of teased her a little bit, but was not mean about it, so then when Kathy calls her out on the whole weird arm thing that they're doing, she turns around and is like, you know, is like, well, you know, you're just mad because I'm moving on, we're moving on, you're going to be left behind, and you're just doing this weird thing where you're, you're getting to know everybody, all the guys. Like, basically calling her a slut. And then, Kathy ends up feeling bad about it. Because she's like, well, I did call her out on this other thing, so, you know, she had a right to call me this, like, she's seen some from Ruth's perspective, and it's like, no, no, her calling you a slut does not compare, or, I mean, you're, or, no, you're being, you're telling her, pointing out, you know, kind of, to, you know, saying you understand why she's doing this little thing with Tommy, and then her turning does not compare to her calling you a slut. Her calling you a slut is messed up, and she's not a great friend. She's also that girl who will try so hard to be cool and will make up stories just to make herself look cool. And I just, she is a horrible friend to Kathy and it's very lucky that Kathy and Tommy are so loyal to her and care so much about her. And there will be these moments where she tries to make them, you know, impressive, make herself look good in front of these the cool older kids that they're hanging out with. And, you know... Kathy will be like, oh, well, if you want to, you know, because at the time when she's, they're having their, you know, offers to be like, well, why don't you be a little closer to them so you, it won't be, you won't have to talk over me. And 
just looks at her and glares at her. It's like, you're ruining everything. And she's like, and she, you know, Kathy is like, oh, maybe she's doing this for us. So, you know, she's like, I started to realize that she was trying to help us out, make us look cool. And it's like, no, honey, she was not. She was making herself look cool. Now, granted, we never hear Ruth's side of the story and we don't hear what Ruth says, but I'm sure she wouldn't make herself look good. She is that girl who will, you know, will... When you call her out, she'll make you feel bad about it. Like, there's a scene when they're kids, and she thinks, she claims that she got this pencil box from their favorite teacher, who doesn't, who wouldn't ever do that. When it's favorite, a kid. And, I mean, although, well, although Kathy does say that some of these teachers do favorite people. But it turns out, Kathy realizes, of course, that Ruth did not get the pencil case and then kind of annoyed, you know, she is calling her out on it because she knows that she got it from a cell. And so, like, she, you know, but then she feels bad because she sees that it's upsetting Ruth and Ruth is embarrassed. So she cry, you know, she's feeling like she's going to cry. So, you know, Kathy takes it back. There's, like, so many little moments where she manipulates Kathy, makes Kathy feel bad, makes Kathy look like she's the mean one. And just, I just... Ooh, I don't know why they're friends. I mean, I think I do. is because Kathy's such a sweet girl. And, you know, she sees the good in Ruth. Even though Ruth is such a brat to her. And so mean to her. And it just annoys me so much. Okay. So next is another classic. Um, character drama classic. And that is St. John, or St. John, from Jane Eyre. He's like Miss Elsa, he doesn't come until later in the story. When everything falls apart for Jane, and she ends up running away, leaving Rochester, her love interest, and ends up runs into these people who take her in because she, she's starving and stuff, and they offer her a shelter and are very kind to her. And, like... So, Sinjin is a character who is a man of God. He's a very, you know, he's a missionary. Um, he's reserved. Very keeps his emotions in check. Because, you know, he's like, emotions are sinful and blah, blah, blah. And, like, they're in... He decides that him and Jane are so much alike and so similar that they should get married and she should, you know, go with him on his missionary journey, on his latest missionary trip, and they should be married. And it's, you know, and it's like Jane, of course, at this point we know that Jane wants passion and love, and she had it, but that fell apart. So she's not gonna, but she's still not gonna marry someone who doesn't give her the passion and love that she wants, that she craves. Because she, and she deserves it. She is a good person who's lost it several times. And she deserves to be happy. And Sinjin will not make her happy. He'll make her miserable. And he just keeps pushing and pushing because it makes sense. And he's even, like, very cold to this one woman who actually likes him, generally has feelings for him, and wants to marry him. But he's like, no, I can't have a marriage of love and passion. I need to marry a, I need to be practical about marriage, which, yeah, I mean, back then there were a lot of women that had to do that. There were women that had to do that had to be practical. But, so, but I can understand why Jane would be, like, want to hold on to a potential marriage that was, you know, out of, that had actual love and passion in it. And he's, and he kind of, you know, and he's so disrespectful to her, like, she wants to, she's studying um, this language that she's really passionate about. She's really into it. She wants to learn it. And she devotes her time. But then Sinjin, who assumes that she will agree to marry him and accompany him on this journey, when she agrees to accompany him but not marry him, which he's like, no, we can't do that because that's improper. Which maybe back then it would be. But, um, and so she, he is like, well, I think you should learn this. And he forces her to learn it. And because Jane is such a caring, loyal person, she listens to him and lets, and gives in to him for a period of time. And it's like, girl, why? That's not what you care. You don't want to learn that. You want to learn this, this language. But he keeps pushing and pushing it. And you know, and of course, 
the only reason he's teaching her is because he expects her to go with him. And he's so pushy about it. And I just... And... He's so, he's, he's not just annoying, but he's also a very, you know, boring character. At least Rochester is interesting, interesting, granted he has a lot of flaws, extreme flaws. But, you know, I can understand why it would be hard to marry someone where there was no passion in the relationship. There was no romance in the relationship. But it's what she cares, what she wants, you know? And towards the end, the you know, he kind of mocks her for it at one point, And... Um, I just cannot stand him. I just, ugh. Okay, next. Um, is a character that I think a lot of people hate, and a lot of people probably did not bat an eyelash when what happened to him happens to him in the series. And that is Joffrey Baratheon, or we may as well say Joffrey Lannister. From the Song of Ice and Fire series. This is the first book. Um, my God, I hate his guts. So he's not just annoying. I hate him. He's a little prick. And he's only like, what, 12, 13 years old? Well, maybe 14 or 15, I don't know. But he's pretty young. And let me see. Because in this actual book, I wrote down their ages. Oh, I actually I didn't say his age, but he's I mean like he's probably like probably like probably like either um, Jon Snow's age or Daenerys' age. Um, but but he's such a little prick. His mom spoiled him so much that he became just a sadistic little prick. He's very acts very entitled, and he's such a brat. But he's such a whiny little baby too. Like, you know, Sansa's sis, little sister Arya is, you know, gives him kind of a hard time, and he's very feisty. And she's like nine years old, nine or eight years old at the time of the, in, when she does that. When she's like, can you like, like attacking him, and it's like you're gonna. You're gonna be all scared of a nine year old girl. And, like, he's always whining. There's, you know, Tyrion tells him off constantly. Unfortunately, that bites him in the ass later when, when Joffrey becomes king. And he is constantly whining. And, like, he's a kid. He's like, I'm telling mom. You know? And I just. Cannot, I just hate him. I hate his gut so much. But I know I'm not the only one who hates him. There's, I think, a lot of characters, a lot of people and characters in this book who hate him. And like I said, I did not bat an eyelash when what happened to his character happened. And I just, I hate him. He's a whiny little bitch. And just, mm. And then the last character is from a book that I might still have it, but it's in a pile in the donation pile because it's not my favorite. I, I, I liked it. I enjoyed it. But I am. It's not my favorite Sarah Waters book. And then is um, Dr. Faraday, the main character, actually, from A Little Stranger. Um, he's, he's really, he's not as bad as some of the other characters, but... He also is kind of like an entitled character. He's the he's again another example of the trope of the nice guy character who acts all entitled. Like he seems all nice and stuff, but will pitch a hissy fin if you know things don't go his way. And the fact that you know doesn't help that you know there's tension between him and his rich family, and while well, he's the middle class doctor, you know, and he's just. Uh, he just wants to marry into the family because he wants to be in this house. He wants to be part of this rich family because he deserves it, you know. And he's not very content. He kind of forces himself, not in the sense of sexually, but he pushes himself into their lives, into the lives of this this rich family whose name they do not last name I don't remember. And there's this like tension there and unsettlingness and like art you know the woman he's trying to marry the um the daughter of the of the family he's all into her 
but she is kind of reluctant. She doesn't know if she wants to be in a relationship with him. I think she has a lot to deal with, and but he keeps pushing it. He pushes himself into her life, into her heart, and she she kind of pushes him away. And he does not understand her. He does not get her or her family. He tries to, but he doesn't. And again, he just acts so entitled. Like I said, he Dr. Faraday is not as bad as some of these other characters. Like, I don't, you know, have my feelings about him aren't as strong. But still, he is incredibly annoying. And I just, you know... I mean, I, I kind of rooted their, for their relationship at first. when I, But then, after thinking it over the years, thinking about it over the years, I'm like, yeah, it's, it's probably... You know, I don't, I don't... I'm glad. It was probably for the best. They didn't, you know... And they don't work out. So those are the seven annoying characters I'm talking about. So, um... Are there any characters that you find so annoying that you would love to share with me? Please feel free to do so. Um, if you like this video, be sure to give a thumbs up. Click subscribe if you haven't already. Click the bell notification below to be notified when I post new videos. I will post a link to the Goodreads, Gro Goodreads 7 on Sunday group if you haven't joined yet and want to. Um, I'll post it in the description box. And I hope you are continuing to wear your mask. Staying six feet apart from people, um, washing your hands, using hand sanitizer, and continuing to enjoy your reading. Alright, bye!